Hello everyone, thank you for joining us. It is our pleasure to be presenting for you today. My name is Gerardo and I will be co-presenting today with Jason. Today we'll be learning about planning your PWA. When someone says they want a progressive web app, it's hard to know what that means, let alone put together a plan to make it happen. PWAs cover a wide range of experiences. They can be as simple as a website on HTTPS with a manifest file and a service worker, or they can be a complex application like Instagram or TikTok. In order to put a plan together, you have to know what you're building. We've found it helpful to consider five factors when looking at the features and complexity of your PWA. The five factors are, how much does it feel like an app? What are you going to do for installation and discovery? What will you use offline functionality for? Will you have push notifications? And if so, how personalized will they be? And what features will you include that are technically not part of the definition of a PWA, but that people often include when building a PWA? Let's look at each of these factors more closely and then talk about how we use them to build a roadmap for our app. What does it mean to make something feel like an app? A couple of years ago, Chris Coyer surveyed readers on CSS tricks and asked them if it is important to distinguish between web apps and websites. 72% answered yes, they are different things with different concerns. But despite the fact that most people agreed that they are different, in the comments it was clear that no one agreed how they are different. As Jeremy Keith once put it, like obscenity and brunch, Web apps can be described, but not defined. In fact, if we have a room full of people who say they want to, feel, to, to make it feel like an app, the only thing I'm confident about is that no one in the room has the same definition of what that means. Often, what we mean when we say feel like an app is that we want something to feel native. The challenge is that feeling native differs from platform to platform, and are you going to update your app every time the underlying operating system changes the way it looks? Frankly, web apps that try too much to feel native often face an uncanny valley. Even if you do an exceptional job, most likely there are areas of an app where something feels just a little off. We believe we spend too much time focused on making things feel native. Instead, we should focus on the characteristics that will make an exceptional user experience over trying to make something feel like iOS or Android or Windows specifically. Part of what makes for an exceptional experience is fast and fluid animations and interactions. These types of animations are possible on the web as demonstrated by Sarah Drasner here for CSS Tricks. They just take more effort. But adding this level of polish and animation is what can give your app personality and make it delightful, as shown here by this super cute login form. In order to make something feel app-like, often people feel like they have to build a single page application using a JavaScript framework. This may make sense, but converting an existing multiple page application such as an e-commerce site to a single page application is no small task. And by the way, there's nothing that says that a PWA has to be a single page application. So don't assume that you have to convert to a SPA to have a PWA, especially if that conversion would be difficult for your organization. There are ways to create SPA-like experiences using multi-page applications. One example is TurboDrive. TurboDrive intercepts regular links, requests the new page using the Fetch API, and then renders the HTML response. The full HTML document is downloaded initially, but only the relevant parts are updated, which means you can provide SPA-like transitions in a multi-page application. There are also a couple of exciting new specifications that are currently being experimented with. One of these new specifications is portals. This demo created by Adam Argyle is a great example. Portals allow you to embed content and then transition to it seamlessly. You'll notice in this demo that content is loaded from various domains, but the experience is much more smooth. 
The portal's specification is currently being worked on in the WICG and can be tested using an experimental flag in Chrome. Similarly, the Shared Element Transitions API is another specification being worked on in the WICG that attempts to bridge the gap between multi-page applications and SPA experiences. It allows you to define basic transitions between pages, like having a new page slide in from the right, for example. The API also allows you to declare areas that will stay the same or transition differently from page to page. Both portals and shared element transitions are still being worked on at the moment, so now is actually a great time to take a peek and provide some feedback. Finally, being app-like isn't a goal unto itself. Whether or not your progressive web app is more of an app or a site is not something your users will be thinking about as they interact with it. Therefore, how much you want something to feel like an app will depend on your organization's goals. You might decide that you don't care if it feels like a website, but you still want to make sure your site is a PWA so that it can provide a faster experience. Or maybe you decide that it does matter that it feels like an iOS or Android app, so you put in the extra time and effort to try to make it feel native. No matter what you decide, make sure you provide an exceptional experience for your users. Speaking of which, if you missed Callie Riggins' talk from earlier today, make sure you go back and watch it later. She covers how to create delightful user experiences with PWAs. The second factor in your PWA plan is installation and discovery. The first thing you should concern yourself with is the add to home screen install prompt. For some browsers, you don't have to do much other than meet a minimum PWA criteria and the browser will ask users if they want to install your app. That criteria may change over time, but even if it stays the same, you should still consider suppressing the prompt until you are fairly certain a user is likely to say yes. Doing so can greatly increase your conversion rate. What about app stores? Well, the great thing about PWAs is, is we don't need app stores. But if you do want to get into an app store, you can with some additional work. For Android, you can use trusted web activities to put your PWA into the Google Play Store, and you can use Bulb Wrap to make the TWA process easier, or you can use PWA Builder, which helps you get your PWA ready for both Google Play and Microsoft stores. Apple's app stores don't support PWAs without using a wrapper like Capacitor. Apps that are simply wrappers for a website will be rejected by Apple, so you should look for ways to progressively enhance your PWA with native capabilities that make sense. If there's nothing that makes sense, understand the design bar is higher, so make sure your app experience is exceptional. And if you missed it, Micah spoke immediately before us on how to bring your PWA to app stores. Be sure to check it out later. Important to note, if you do submit your app to an app store, you have to play by the app store rules, including things like giving the app store a cut of your purchases. So make sure you're considering the full implications of being in an app store. And remember, you don't have to be in an app store to be found. Because a PWA is your site, normal web marketing applies. Pausing for a moment though, I find it a bit odd to define when a PWA is really installed. Let's take a look at a typical user flow to show you what I mean. A bunch of people find out about your site either through a search, social media, or your marketing. Finding your site is a big deal, so congratulations. While they are browsing your site, the browser downloads a service worker, it installs behind the scenes, and starts running. At this point, your site is now a PWA. You can support an offline experience, push notifications, the Payment Request API, WebAuthn. You can use whatever web technology makes sense. At some point in the future, the user may decide that your PWA is useful enough to install the icon on their home screen. But even if they don't, you can still do everything else with your PWA. The only thing the home screen installation really does is add an icon. So why do we spend so much time focusing just on that little part? when there's so much more to consider when accounting for the entire experience. Remember, not everyone will add your PWA to their home screen, 
but every visitor will install your PWA once the service worker is installed. So again, there is a continuum. We've had clients on both ends of the spectrum. Some clients didn't want people to be prompted to install the PWA, and we've had other clients who felt being in native app stores was critical. And now I'll pass it over to Jason, who will talk about the third factor, offline mode. Thank you, Arado. The third factor is what you use offline for. At minimum, you should use caching to improve the performance and provide an offline fallback page. In fact, Google was planning to make a fallback page part of the criteria for installation. They put this plan on hold, but you can be certain that something like this will be a requirement in the future. The next easiest thing to do for offline is to cache pages as people visit them. That's what we do at Cloud4 because we don't know what article someone is going to want to have access to offline. As someone visits pages, we cache them. If they're offline, they can still read those pages. If they hit a page that isn't cached, we let them know. Offline functionality can get much, much more complex. Todoist tackles one of the toughest offline challenges, which is the ability to have multiple devices editing the same content while offline. They do this both in their progressive web app and in their native applications. And reconciling conflicting offline edits is tough to do. You have to decide which offline edit should take precedent. At minimum, if you can't support offline editing, let people know so they don't waste their time making a lot of edits only to find that they can't save those changes. So again, we have the choice about how complex our offline behavior will be, which is going to implant, imp impact our app planning. For push notifications, the actual client-side implementation isn't too difficult, but there are many hidden challenges, particularly if your organization has never sent notifications in the past. The simplest version of push notifications could be to use a CMS plugin for a push notification service. This is what we do at Cloud4. Our site's built on WordPress. The primary thing that people are interested in is when new articles are published. And so we use this plugin so that when an article is published, a push notification goes out. The nice thing about these notification services is that they take care of things like analytics and user segmentation, sort of complex features you'd otherwise have to build on your back end yourself. These services also allow you to send whatever messages you like, but you need to be careful because people don't like push notifications. They're annoyed by them. Nobody wants to receive more notifications. The only time that they find them useful is when they're personalized, when they're timely. So sending bulk messages is likely to cause somebody to unsubscribe or block you. And that personalization, that's the tricky part. That's what makes push notifications take so much time to implement. This flow chart shows the decision tree that Slack has to go through when it decides whether or not to send a push notification and where to send that notification. The point isn't that we can you know, copy Slack's tree or, or even that our decision trees will be as complex as Slack's is. The point is that actually figuring out when to send a notification and making sure that it's timely and personal is something complex, even for, say, an organization like an e-commerce company. Um, you might decide that uh, as an e-commerce company that the best thing to do would be to have people sign up for notifications as their order status changes. That would be really, really useful to know when it's shipped and to find out your tracking number and things of that nature. That's a great use case. But if your order processing system isn't set up to have events that you can hook onto to send notifications from, it's probably going to take quite a bit of work to add that into your backend system. So remember, you don't need push notifications to be a progressive web app. And your business model and backend will likely have a bigger impact on push, your push notification complexity than the PWA itself. The fifth factor is a bit of catch-all for all the things that aren't technically part of a PWA, but that we often hear people talk about all the same. For example, Pinterest uses the Credential Management API to log people back into their PWA automatically. Supporting that API and its extension to WebAuthn can allow people to log in using biometric data like fingerprints. And speaking of fingerprints, the Payment Request API lets people buy things more easily via Google Pay, Apple Pay, similar services. In fact, it's so easy that I once accidentally bought a pair of socks from, J. Crew, from J. Crew when I was trying to take a screenshot for the book on PWAs that I was writing. Um, I forgot that the home button on my old iPhone, the same thing that I needed to use to take that screenshot, was the fingerprint sensor. Um, so... I ended up buying these socks, 
the Groundhog Day socks. I think they're really cool. There's only one Groundhog per sock that actually sees its shadow. And my son was born on Groundhog's Day, so I was actually... I was thinking about buying them anyways, but it still was a shock when I was waiting for the screenshot to show up. And then all of a sudden I got the confirmation saying that I had bought socks instead of getting a screenshot. So as your organization starts working on its PWA, it may make sense to look at opportunities to add additional features beyond what is technically part of the definition of PWA. And because that definition can be confusing for people, it's worth asking whether others in your organization want or expect some of these features in their new PWA. So how do you take these five factors and build them into a plan? Well, one of the nice things about progressive web apps is that you can build them progressively. You can create a progressive roadmap. Unlike native applications, a PWA doesn't have to be some monolithic binary that you submit to the app store when all the work is done and then you Pray to the App Store gods that your app gets approved. You can deliver small improvements along the way and users will benefit. And that's what we did when we converted our own site into PWA a few years ago. We started with a redesign um, and that redesign, when we launched it, we also moved to HTTPS. We added a manifest file to make bookmarks better. Um, and then a few months later, we added a service worker. We added an offline fallback. And technically at that point, it was a progressive web app. But we kept working on it. We added offline um, pages and we added an offline indicator. We improved some performance. Then we added push notifications and did some additional performance improvements. And finally, we announced that it was a PWA. But we haven't stopped. We continue to improve it. And as a matter of fact, we've got a new site that's in the works and hopefully will come out in the next couple of months. The point, though, is that at each one of these releases, we were actually providing value to users. Our website got better for the people who visited it, even when it wasn't fully a progressive web app yet. So every progressive web app roadmap will be different, but we try to look for ways that an organization can incrementally build towards a PWA. To start, you need to know where you're going, and that's where the five factors come in. Gather your team together to figure out what your ideal progressive web app would be. For every organization, where they fall in the continuum for these five factors will be different. And if we could recommend one more thing while you're in the planning phase, it would be to get some benchmark measurements of performance and conversion before you start your work. Being able to prove the work you're doing is improving the bottom line will help build for momentum in your organization when you need to take on the cost and, the, and sort of the pain of building more complex features. After you've got your direction set, you should assess your site to see if there's any technical debt that needs to be addressed. If the site is too slow or isn't usable on small screens, a PWA isn't going to fix those issues. Next, you might build a baseline progressive web app by adding a manifest file, a service worker, and an offline fallback. Then we recommend looking at front-end additions. We suggest this because oftentimes it becomes much more complex when you include other teams inside your organization. So if you have the team that's working on the PWA, start looking at caching recently viewed pages or pre-caching popular pages, making sure that um, maybe you add a, a you know, simple push notification service in. Um, you can do those things without involving too many people. And you build up the credibility you need to tackle those larger initiatives like the payment request API, credential management, um, push notifications. The great thing about a roadmap like this is that once you're past the planning stages, you can release those improvements incrementally and each one provides value to your users. In fact, that's the thing that I like best about progressive web apps. Each step on the path to a PWA makes sense on its own. All you have to do is start and we can't wait to see what you build. If you want to learn more about how to plan a progressive web app, my book for a book apart is back in print now and it's available as an ebook as well. On behalf of Gerardo and I, thank you for your time.